Well, welcome to all of you. I'm glad you're here. It's wonderful to see you. I'm delighted to be here to introduce Chelsea Connerboy, who writes about Boston's medical history, state and national health care policy, and advancements in medical research for the White Coat Notes blog on Boston.com and for the Boston Globe. And I told Chelsea I was just going to get up here and say, Chelsea's wonderful, and sit down. Um, but I'll say a couple more things. Uh, Chelsea was my advisee some years ago, and what I remember most about Chelsea uh, is her drive and her talent, and I think we all knew she was going to go off and do good work. Um, when I was getting ready for her visit, I went to her website, and I found on it at that time a statement that says something about how important journalism is. And the statement was, deepening our understanding of our neighbors, their triumphs and struggles, their untold histories, makes us all more compassionate, relieves our collective hardship, and inspires. And I think that says a lot about what makes Chelsea such an amazing journalist. So, Chelsea Conboy. Well, um, first just, Thank you all uh, so much for this week. It's really been a, a great couple of days. I've, I've um, had such a, a fun time talking with students one-on-one -on -one and with the TNH staff and in classes. It's really just been a great time for me to kind of reflect on, on what this job is and where I've come from since I've sat in, in your seats and, um, and also where I think you all are, are going. And it's a, it's exciting. So um, thank you to Lisa and the rest of the department for, for inviting me to be here. It's, it's really um, an honor. Um, well, I, I didn't ever know Don Murray directly. I never, um, you know, obviously never had him in class or didn't sort of have a mentee relationship with him. I consider myself very much a student of his students. Um, obviously here at UNH and then at Pointer and in my professional life, his influence has really been a constant for me. So um, anything with his name attached to it really carries a lot of weight for me. So I'm um, accepting this role implied that I have something to say, that I have something to impart upon this group, which includes so many of my teachers. And frankly, I had a really hard time figuring out what that was. Um, that's partly because I uh, am very much in the early stages of my own career and um, trying to find my way in a fast changing industry and really just a few steps ahead of all of the students here. I, um, I like to ask people when I meet them about, writers in particular, about um, how they got from there to here, you know, how their career path unfolded. It's uh, encouraging to me to, to hear how the pieces fit together, to see that sometimes missteps lead to launching pads and times when they think they're in sort of a long plateau was just kind of like a resting period, you know, before the next, the next peak, the next big opportunity. Sometimes though, when I hear these stories from longtime journalists about um, how they spent decades doing strong work for a mid-sized paper in a community that they loved, or how they climbed up the newspaper ladder from small to big and wound up at a major metro or working abroad, I am left feeling more unsettled than I am inspired. Many of the career paths that our mentors and our teachers took are gone. And that's just the truth. I, I don't want to spend a lot of time on this point. I, um, on, you know, on, on how things have changed, how newspapers aren't what they used to be, or how readership is plummeting, which I don't believe. I think that's not true. Um, I don't really want this to be a speech about how we're going to right the ship together. Um, I get kind of tired of those conversations, and I'm going to bet that some of you do too. My point is just that while journalism has really always been a challenging and often winding career path, 
young journalists today have to be more prepared than ever to find their own way. The well-worn roots are fading. The truth is that this is exciting. Um, what's more exciting than starting on an adventure and not knowing where it's going to take you? But it's scary, too. At this point, we really can't answer the question, you know, where, where are you going? We don't know what things are going to be like years from now. So I suggest that we ask it in a different way. What are you fighting for? And I really mean that question. What are you fighting for? Why have you picked this field? What will keep you going when you are faced with uncertainty, anxiety about what lies ahead, choices about which direction to take? What are you fighting for? I think the answer to that can help us to find our bearing. So I thought I'd talk a, a bit about what I have found worth fighting for during the 10 years since I first worked in the professional newsroom. I had an internship between my sophomore and junior years at the Lewiston Sun Journal. And I remember being terrified pretty much every day. Um, but it was a great experience. I wrote about all the things of summer internship, every summer festival that the city had. Fourth of July, the Hot Air Balloon Festival, the Festival de Joie, which is the city's French-Canadian celebration. I profiled the local head of the Salvation Army. I hid behind a tree with a veteran photographer at a campground where they thought there was a gunman on the loose. I wrote about the restoration of the beautiful St. Peter and Paul Basilica, whose spires you can see from the highway when you drive by Lewiston. It was 2002, and Lewiston was going through a dramatic change. Somali refugees were settled through a government program in Portland and in big cities across the country, had begun moving there by the hundreds. Drawn by available housing, good schools, and the chance to create a safer community for themselves. It was a big change for the overwhelmingly white post-industrial city. And um, that summer, I never wrote about the refugees. That was actually mostly done by another UNH alum, Lisa Chemilecki. But I had the chance to see up close the remarkable role that the Sun Journal played in that city's evolution. The newspaper explained to long-time residents who the Somalis were, where they had come from, and what it took to get there. It answered the questions that were on a lot of readers' minds. What would the influx more than 1,000 people in 18 months mean for the city? Could the schools handle it? What about social services? It gave readers a space, to, space on the opinion pages to, to work out um, differences that they had, to say, this is who we are, and this is who we should be. At least 3,000 Somalis now live in the city, accounting for nearly 10% of, of Lewiston's population. By some estimates, the number is twice that. Somali-run stores are a fixture downtown. And last year, Somalis, for the first time, ran for public office. Reporters play a lot of roles in a community like Lewiston, including being the keepers of record and holding accountable the people who control the political process and the purse strings. My experience helped me to begin to see the role that I perhaps most identified with. At a basic level, journalists should introduce neighbors to each other. They should help us to know one another. Because we can't really decide who we want to be as a community until we know who we are now. After college, I got a job at the Concord Monitor where I covered many beats, including City Hall and the environment and the refugee community in, in Concord. The Monitor is a really unique place that gives reporters and photographers there a lot of latitude to um, just really figure out what works for them. Um, the city editor, Hans Schultz, has this, he, he puts a lot of faith into his young reporters, and he has this way of believing in them, but not telling them that <laughs> up front. Um, within my first couple of years there, with his encouragement, I had discovered my love of narrative writing, of conveying to readers what 
writer and, and teacher Tom French calls the, the felt experience. Not just asking people about what happened, but being there when it happens. I remember distinctly how I felt the first day I sat with Carolyn St. Pierre and her husband Rich at the kitchen table in their Concord home in the spring of 2006. And uh, my apologies to those of you who have heard this a few times at, at this point <laughs> this week, but um, a friend of Carolyn's had introduced me to the couple and um, they started to tell me their story. They talked about how they had met just a few years earlier on a, on a blind date and fallen in love. Uh, about a year into the courtship, Carolyn, who had two children from a previous marriage, Brian and Melissa, found out that she was pregnant with a third. Elijah was born in July 2002. Nearly two years later, after months of pain in her shoulder and in her chest and a uh, nagging cough that puzzled doctors and left Carolyn with a, a feeling that something just wasn't right, um, she finally was diagnosed with a rare liver cancer. The prognosis was bad. Days before she was scheduled for a complicated surgery that would remove a, a large portion of her liver, and one that um, doctors said the, that was risky and, and for which doctors really weren't sure it would work, um, Rich and Carolyn married in their backyard in sickness and in health, Carolyn said, as she told me about that day. It was so real. Carolyn knew that a cure was unlikely. She was fighting for as much time as she could get with her children. Excuse me. And she had a, a worthy ally in Rich who had, uh, excuse me, who had uh, lost his own mother when he was a young boy and really didn't um, remember her. And he was just willing to do whatever he could possible to make sure that his own son had, um, had memories that he never had. That included allowing uh, photographer Preston Ganaway and I to follow the family through their journey. From the start, I, I really felt that I, I knew that this was a, a special story. I knew because of how I felt when I was around them because of how strong their love was and how eloquently they spoke of, about what they were going through. And because they opened up to us right away, which to journalists is just a, a true gift. But there were times when others would ask what I was working on when I found it really hard to explain. Carolyn was not a famous person. Her family was not remarkable in ways that typically make the news industry take note. There was absolutely no news hook in their tale. Family faces cancer. What was remarkable was the courage that Carolyn and Rich and their extended family showed in lifting the curtain on their life. Preston and I spent time with them at the hospital during birthdays and holiday celebrations. We were there when Carolyn came home from the hospital for the last time, when she and Rich sorted through photos that would be shown at her wake, on the long nights that her family kept vigil as she lie awake or asleep in a hospital bed um, set up in the guest, guest room of her home. Sometimes she, she would sleep for hours while her family members told stories. Other times she held court there with her wry humor as sharp as ever. We were there the day she died, and with her permission, we followed her family for about 10 months afterward as they struggled to find their way without her. The story was published in five parts over the course of about a year and a half. The reaction was overwhelming, and more so when Preston was awarded the Pulitzer Prize for feature photography in 2008. People from all over the world began emailing, say, saying they were touched by the story, thanking for Rich and thanking Rich and, and his family for their openness. And um, many of these people were folks who had lost loved ones or who were in the process of lo losing them. One woman wrote that she had 
never purchased the Concord Monitor before the day the paper reran portions of the Remember Me stories. She picked it up by chance, looking for reading material in a few hours she had to waste. The day before, she had learned that her mother, who was sick with lung cancer, was being moved to hospice care. Over the last 24 hours, she wrote, I have struggled with how to perceive this reality that the end is nearing. I never would have known that buying a newspaper would create such a sense of peace for me in this regard. I left the Concord Monitor in late 2009 for the Philadelphia Inquirer, where I eventually became a health reporter. In early 2011, I was helping with coverage of a really a grisly case there. A doctor who offered abortion services was charged with eight counts of murder. One for a woman who died in his care, and another seven for babies the prosecutor said he delivered live and then killed. According to the grand jury report on the case, which laid out the allegations in gruesome detail, state regulators had long ignored signs of trouble at this facility, including a history of injured patients. I, um, I spent an afternoon walking around the mostly poor neighborhood where he had lived and worked. And this is the, the accused doctor. Um, I was looking for people who knew him, who could, could start to explain how a man who was once um, respected as a community organizer who had brought health care to an underserved part of the city could be accused of, of such crimes. Nearly every woman I spoke to had a story. They had been treated by Goss Kermit Gosnell or had a, a close family or a friend who had. Nearly all had a tale of a woman they knew who had been sickened after a procedure he had performed. One young woman told me she had been hospitalized for more than a week from infection. She had gone to him because she trusted him, she said, because he was a neighbor. Many of the stories we tell are not uplifting. They are not reaffirming of the human spirit or of our ability to struggle for good or to cope with tragedy but they make us look at ourselves and at our neighbors and to make choices. This is who we are. This is who we should be. These are the things that to me are worth fighting for. This is where I find my bearings in serving a community of readers and helping us as people who live on the same block, in the same town, in the same state, in the same state of affliction, helping us to know each other better so that collectively we can make better choices in reaching that goal through story. For me, the, for the fight mostly has been internal, about the choices I make as a reporter, about how I decide to think about my role and how that thinking shapes my actions. I now write one of the Globe's healthcare blogs it serves a really good purpose, covering Boston's dominant economy, the doctors and hospitals that make it one of the premier medical cities in the world. A colleague of mine made a joke recently. While working on something expected to get a lot of hits on the website, and please excuse my language, but what this person said was loudly enough for me and for others to hear it was, where such traffic whores? I'm sure the post had to do with sex or drugs or Justin Bieber, <laughs> and the comment was a joke. It was a joke, but even as I sat there stoically, some little part of me, of my spirit, <laughs> stood up on my desk and shook my fists and shouted, I am not a traffic whore. <laughs> I will learn about what drives traffic online. I will master search engine optimization. I have spent time and effort developing a social media following. I think hard about how to serve an audience of readers online and how to spread our good work 
to the most people. I do all of that with pleasure. But I will do it because I believe the stories that we tell are important and deserve attention. I will do it in, with, with mission in mind. Whether it's at the Globe, in my work as a freelancer, in the books I hope to write someday, in the work that will shape what I believe will be a long career as a writer, I will keep this as my bearing. And before I stop, I just want to say one other thing on a, on a personal note. Um, I just want to acknowledge my grandparents are in the audience, and I think I have gained a lot from them. That has helped me professionally. My, my grandfather, Frank Conaboy, is a true storyteller. And my grandmother, um, who will turn 92 this year, I, I think that I get a lot of my natural curiosity from her. And I just want to tell one little story. We took a, a trip to New York City to celebrate her 90th birthday a couple of years back. And um, we went to a, a fancy show on Broadway. And we went out to dinner. And we stayed in a hotel on Times Square. And I woke up one night in the middle of the night. And I found her there with her head poked out the drapes. She'd sort of pinched them closed under her chin so that the light from the square wouldn't, wouldn't wake us. And um, at 90 years old, she wanted to see what did Times Square look like at 3 in the morning. And um, I just think that if my thirst for the world is um, what hers is for, for half the number of years, I will really be blessed. So I'm so glad that you're here. Thank you. <laughs> Sue? <laughs> Jesse, what are the opportunities, what, what have you found are the opportunities for um, long narratives like you did at the Monitor and that, you know, that was sort of the cornerstone of the globe? Um, what are those opportunities now online? Um, well, so online, I think that they're great. But first, I, I should say, um, you know, I, I, I kind of feel like when I was graduating that those, the, the, the kind of word was that those, that those stories were dying, that the newspapers, and including, you know, in addition to shrinking their um, foreign staffs, were cutting space for um, that kind of story. You know, that there was this debate about, like, was that kind of storytelling dead? Did readers really want it? And um, I think one test of, testament to the fact that that's not the case was that the Globe recently brought Tom French in to, to speak for a week, or a couple of days anyways, to staff. And um, you know, last, last year invested in the Bus 19 project, which is, was a major sort of narrative um, series. And I know that they have more stuff in the works. So there's a place for it in traditional newspapers that um, people didn't think there would be at this point. Um, but I think that there's a lot of room for it on, online. Literally, there's a lot of room for it online, but also there's a lot of um, interest in it. If you look at Byliner or um, uh, websites like that or um, the curation sites like Longform or, or others you know, that um, are kind of uh, really nurturing an audience for, for that kind of work. And I think it's going to keep growing. I'm excited about, <laughs> about the future for that. Probably answer them all. <laughs> um, what, I mean, you said that health reporting, that beat, wasn't what you had necessarily gone out into journalism looking for. Yeah. Um, and what would you say in terms of like trying to find what you're passionate about in writing? How do you do it? Just Here's kind of how that comes about. Yeah. Um, so you're right. I I didn't start as a health reporter. Is that what you mean? That that I kind of I did sort of stumble into it a little bit. But I, uh, yes. So you know I I think that one thing that if you don't know sort of where you want to specialize, I think that you should just get out and try to write for as as about as diverse a group of beats as you can. You know, like especially if you can if you can get to a community newspaper or for a, a um, news website that has you um, just 
covering a variety of topics, I think it's really useful. You know, when I started at the Globe, I, I mean, at the Monitor, I um, was a regional reporter, which means I covered a bunch of towns. And so I was covering everything, cops and courts and local politics and features and farming and history projects that were going on in these towns. I mean, you, you, when you get into that sort of general assignment role, you get a chance to really cover a wide variety. And then just pay attention to what you're drawn to. I think, I mean, looking back now, a lot of the bigger work that I did at the Monitor was healthcare focused, although I didn't really recognize it then. Um, but that was something that I was naturally drawn to, those stories. Um, and then the other fat point I would say is listen to the people who know you, sorry, who know you well. Um, and look for mentors who can help you to figure that out. Um, the reason why I ended up in healthcare really is because I, I had a, an editor at the Inquirer who I think saw potential in me and, and who I really loved working for. And he wasn't even my editor. He kind of ended up just pulling me in on things. And then eventually he hired me as a, as a health reporter. So. Um, I think know yourself and and like actively work to know yourself and um, and and work with your mentors to, to figure it out. Um, you've worked at both like smaller local papers and then obviously like larger city papers um, and especially like with um, the time that you've been writing sort of like as journalism gets more and more digital. Mm -hmm. um, how would you say that sort of like readership and, and responses that you get from readers um, with, with those different types of papers and also as things digitize, mm -hmm. um, how is that different? Mm -hmm. um, so when you're writing for what you could call a community newspaper, you know, a, a smaller newspaper, um, the reaction is really close to you. Like it could be, it could be in your inbox or on your voicemail, but um, you also live among the people that you're writing about. So that's a really interesting experience because for one, you're like hyper accountable <laughs> for, for what you do because really they're, they're the people who know you. Um, you know, it's a really cool thing. Like you pull up to the gas pump and you hear people talking about your story outside the gas station, like that's really, close <laughs> and um, and at the Globe I mean or at the Inquirer um, is this what you're asking about like this kind of reaction from readers yeah at the Inquirer I mean I think um, everything's just bigger you know the the audience the actual readership numbers are so much bigger and what you do on on the front page of the Inquirer might make news on the nightly news, you know, like it's it's just um, it's sort of in a way like it's less personal, but it's um, it's just it's bigger. Like there's a different kind of weight to it. Um, and then digitally, I I feel like that's a hard question to answer. Um, the the thing that I think is great about um, working sort of online first, I, is that you, it's much easier to kind of like create more of a conversation with people um, than in either of the other roles. Like, so I, I, there are people that I know like read the blog all the time. And if I write about one topic, I'm gonna hear from them either in the comments or in my email box. And you know, I can sort of use that uh, because I, I'm writing a blog, I can like kind of use that to, to um, to build it up in some ways. Like some of what I write about there is based on reaction I got. And you don't always have that sort of, you don't, you don't have that flow um, in the paper. In the paper, it's sort of like you flash out a story and it goes in the paper and like that part is done and you might do another story where on the blog, I feel like there's much more of a recogni recognition that it's a, a constant conversation and a work in progress. So. I don't know, there's less of a beginning and an end there. So I don't know if that answered your yeah. question, but. 
What drew you to um, newspaper journalism as opposed to broadcast journalism? Because I know that like, when people say journalist, it could be a very broad term for either or. And I know when I tell people that I want to be a journalist, they're like, oh, so you want to be on TV? And I'm yeah. like, no, not at all. I just never had an inclination to be a broadcast reporter. I mean, this is like really hard for me to, to get up and do this. So I think it would, you know, I just wasn't in, in me um, to do that. But I also was really drawn to the writing process. I mean, that was important. And I know that there's a lot of that, um, you know, involved in broadcast. But it was, um, I don't know, I, I just... I think I just wanted to be a writer, and it just it felt like the natural way for me to go. Yeah. When you uh, sign up for one of these long-term total immersion kinds of stories, like the, the one in, in Concord with the family with the cancer, um, what kind of preparation do you do, uh, both, both before you actually start the reporting and, and as you're going mm -hmm. along? I don't think I knew what I was signing up for with that story, honestly. But, um, but there, I, it's it's a. Um, and so the preparation kind of happened. You know, I feel like in any of the longer projects I've done, it's been sort of that's hap that's been very integrated with the process. It was it wasn't sort of done at the beginning. But um, what I'll say is that um, if you do have time before or you know, definitely during the reporting process, you kind of uh, have to just be prepared to, to get to know the story from every possible angle. So, you know, like, um, uh, I would say it's, for me, it's been about interviewing every everyone who sort of touches the story, you know, and a lot of those people aren't ever in in the narrative, but um, you know, I, I guess it's it's been trying to think of it beyond what's gonna, but just the narrative line that I ends up in the story. I don't, I don't know. It's hard because I because I don't feel like I've done that conscientious preparation. Um, I I'll say one other thing um, about that though is is to try to look at what's been done before, um, to read other people's work that's similar and. Um, both so that you can try to do it differently and also so that you can see what works and how they've done it. So, you know, reading about, um, I know that like when I was working on that story, I, um, I read and looked at the photos for the, um, this is going back a little ways, the Sacramento Bee was, is, is anyone remembering the Pulitzer story that won? there of the boy who was dying and his mother. It was like two years, I think, before Preston. Um, I'm not going to remember it. I'm sorry. But, you know, just to look at examples of other work that um, similar. I don't know. Uh, in this rapidly changing environment, for you, what do you see as your biggest challenges as a journalist to succeed in what's happening to the newspaper industry? Mm -hmm. <laughs> the biggest challenge, um, I think that my biggest day-to-day -day challenges um, are twofold, I guess. One, keeping up with it all. Um, I, I blog and I, you know, manage certain social media tools and I'm right um, regularly for the paper, and I um, try to think about bigger picture stories, and I feel like my attention is sort of fragmented, and it's harder to um, do well at all of those things. I feel like I have to work extra hard to do well at, at each of those, um, where in past jobs, really, the thing that I've had to worry about is building a beat and writing that day's story. Um, so. Uh, that's kind of a small scale thing in the sense of like how how do you be successful? You have to do well do well at the job that you do, and now the job involves much more than it used to. Do you find that like at ten o'clock at night you're on Facebook and interacting, yeah. or is it it's like one of those things where like the I'm, notion of a nine to five job no longer oh, exists? Yeah, definitely. 
And but I think that part of it is that you have to figure out how to make that work for you. And I, and I don't mean make a, a con I mean set up boundaries for yourself. Um, you know, I'll be che checking my Twitter feed from bed on my smartphone and being like, what am I? It's actually going to be better for me to get a good night's sleep. <laughs> um, and then the other thing I'd say is, um, I lost my train of thought. Um, successes. So uh, fractured and Oh, uh, so I, you know, figuring out how to do meaningful work. You know, I, this there's a lot of small things you have to do now. Like the blog is sort of a, a lot of a, a lot of chunks of of um, chunks of news that go out quickly, and I want to have time in my schedule to do thoughtful, to to be thoughtful about um, about what I do. And so when you're kind of like on the constant churn, how do you then step off that treadmill and, and um, think about how to mm, just do things differently? Um, I may have missed this because I came in a little bit late, but um, I was just curious more about how the White Coat Notes blog came about because I think there's a great opportunity for mm -hmm. journalists to kind of pitch ideas for blogs mm -hmm. um, at bigger um, newspapers or magazines um, just to have online content. Um, so what was that process like for you? I didn't pitch this blog. It actually was um, there beforehand. But I do agree with you that there's a lot of opportunity for that. And um, I think that if you I actually think that that would be like a great thing to think about in job interviews. Like if you are interviewing at a publication and you think you could bring a blog to them um, to really like think it out and maybe even write some practice posts and include that in your um, package or talk about it when you walk in to, to meet with them. Um, I think you're right that that opportunity is huge. Um, I The white coat notes blog, which I didn't pick the name either, but like it's very hard to say. Um, uh, I, it's been around for a little while. I th it was like one of the Globe's earlier blogs, I think, because um, just it, it's been around for a few years at least. Um, however, you know, in my case, I, you know, I, I stepped into to it being a certain thing, and I've been talking with my editor to try to make it more of my own, um, to try to find ways to do things differently and um, to use my skills, you know, in that format. And um, so for me, that's just been about um, brainstorming. And I'm, I have an editor who's open to that stuff. So um, uh, yeah, it's and, and thoughtful brainstorming, you know, to, to really think through what you want it to be and have a good concrete um, concrete idea. What I don't think is good is to sort of go, just say I want to start a blog. It has to have a point and um, you know, sort of a focus. First off, just a comment. I you visited a couple of classes uh, of mine. I know others. And thanks for that. I think there's a lot of great conversations and information and instruction sharing about fundamentals of interviewing and finding sources and finding stories. Um, and in the editing class, you made the point that uh, that students and young journalists need to be their own best editor, and that uh, in something like the White Coat Notes, that's literally true, <laughs> because you might be your only editor. Um, how do you, do you have any practical advice on how to apply <laughs> sort of the standards of the deeper reporting mm -hmm. that you've done at sort of light speed of a blog, where <laughs> you have minutes maybe to report and verify and publish? Um, you know, either practical tips or just thoughts on that, mm. how, to, how to maintain that integrity of the reporting. Yeah. Um, so you're saying standards. That's what the integrity so thinking, versus, yeah, tricks you do on deadline. Yeah. Kind of, yeah. So we talked about them a little bit in, in that in class, but I, yeah, I, I, there are times when I, um, there might be another set of eyes on what I write before it goes online, but I, I know that that person also is really strapped for time and she might spend just about five minutes looking at it and I know that that's not enough time to really have been thorough, so um, it makes me nervous. But um, uh, so um, 
I think that one, um, one thing to do is sort of to just really like take a moment to pause, to, to get up and, and walk away from your desk and go fill up your water bottle and come back and look at it again. And you're, you're not going to be fresh, but it, uh, maybe that moment of, of rest in between will give you a chance to look at it anew. And, um, um, and then at like a kind of more granular level, if it's something that you are concerned about and you have time, you know, print it out and do a fact checking thing just like you would on a longer piece. Um, fact check it, you highlight things and cross them out and, and go through it with a fine comb tooth the way you would um, uh, on those 3,000 word stories. Um, and integrity wise, I think the biggest thing is to not ever think of what you're doing on a blog or online and or in shorter news stories as anything less than the full journalism that you do in the stories that you have a longer time to report. Um, I think, um, you know, the story I told sort of at the end of, you know, there's this kind of pressure to be <clears throat> a content producer rather than a journalist to, to turn things out, and I just really reject that idea. You know, I just, I don't, I think it's bad for me as a professional and it's bad for journalism if we think about ourselves that way. And um, so, you know, in the t integrity question, I think, you know, that's sort of it. Like hold, hold yourself to the same standards that you learn now um, in whatever job you take in journalism. Know, know those standards and, and keep yourself to them. Yeah. Yeah. I uh, for the most part I was. I I um, for the most part I had a, um, I had a beat to cover that whole time, and so I was doing daily reporting. There was some ebb and flow there, though. You know, there were months that went by when I would maybe go to see the family every week, but I would maybe call Rich, the husband, you know, twice in a week, and then um, there were periods, you know. Um, around like the holidays or um, at, towards the end of Carolyn's life uh, when I was there. The last two weeks, I think I was probably there just about every day. And Preston and I, especially in the last week, wanted someone to be there all the time. So at that time, um, we weren't doing daily work. Um, uh, and you know, there were points when I had to talk to my editor about that and say, I just can't. I can't do it. He, I remember that I had an assignment to do on the day of Carolyn's funeral, and I just I couldn't do it. And I, my editor was fine. <laughs> you know, he he totally understood. And um, so there's a real there's a real ebb and flow. But with these projects, especially at newspapers, you don't get a year and a half to to focus on it entirely. So you have to. Um, at one point this week, I was talking about you have to work, learn to work on multiple tracks. You sort of have your daily track, and you're doing everything that you need to do to keep, you know, do your job and keep your editor happy. And then you're trying to carve out 20 minutes or an hour or maybe more than that on some days to work on the things that are longer and, um, you know, need your attention over time. Again, on that story. You worked with the family for months. You must have gotten emotionally involved yourself to some extent. Yeah. How did you manage that aspect of it? How did you manage to step back from that, write the story, do what you had to do? I um, feel uh, we've talked a bit about this in classes this week. I, um, you know, I really feel like. Um, the emotions that you feel in these kinds of stories are important, and they're, you know, the they're they're what makes stories like this good. Ultimately, when a when a reporter can acknowledge sort of how they feel about their subject, I um, I didn't ever. There was never 
really a situation where I had to put my foot down with them. The, this family was really like aware of sort of what we were doing and got, seemed to get it. So like I never had to say, no, I can't give your son a ride or, you know, those kind of like obvious things, which was great. Um, uh, and I think that the, in terms of how to be sure that my writing had the integrity I wanted it to have. I, Preston and I talked, the photographer and I talked about this a lot and I, we talked about how we were feeling a lot and, um, and I just, I, I think the key is to know how you're feeling and to know, to like recognize it and kind of like call it what it is and to then you have the capacity to make sure that you're not letting that influence how you portray the reality of what happened. Um, that was especially hard after Carolyn died um, because, um, well, for one thing, I felt like I was grieving her, and so that was an interesting thing. But also our kind of stories and our mission was less clear. Like, you know, we, when you're telling the stories up until the point that she dies, you, you, there's like an end point and you know the journey that you're on and then afterward like you're I, I was grieving her and I was watching Rich make some choices that maybe weren't the best for the family and that other family members were frustrated with and and it was like a dark hole sometimes you know to go to the house and it was you know at that point like I, I felt like it was it was harder and we had to, Preston and I just had to kind of like, we were, were great partners in that way that we, um, we, you know, helped each other to work it out, I think. Um, yeah. So. Thank, Thank you all. You so Thank you for coming.